You're listening to Agile Ideas, the podcast, hosted by Fatima Rabucci. For anyone listening out there not having a good day, please know there is help out there. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Agile Ideas. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Fatima, CEO at Agile Management Office, Mental Health Ambassador, and your host. Today, I have a special guest because I have been working with Joe for many years now and and actually worked together in partnership for the PMO Leader, which we'll learn more about. Joe Puss is also known very well as PMO Joe, is an internationally recognized leader in the project management and PMO community. He's a frequent keynote speaker, author, project management innovator, and was named the 2022 America's PMO Influencer of the Year by the PMO Global Alliance. Joe speaks on topics of leadership, PMO's purpose-driven mindset, the project management journey, and a variety of other topics. He is the founder and president of the PMO Squad, a Phoenix-based PMO and project management consulting firm serving clients across the United States. The PMO Squad was named Winner 2022 Small Business Awards by the Phoenix Business Journal, and Joe was the host of the long-standing, very popular Project Management Office Hours radio show. The show overall has had over 40 million plays and downloads, featuring guests, including myself, from around the world. Joe is also the co-founder of VPMMA, the Veteran Project Manager Manage- Mentor Alliance, which is a not-for-profit organization assisting veterans seeking to transition into civilian project management careers. As a founder of the PMO Leader Global Community, He's also built a global e-commerce community for PMO leaders and teams to share content, gain knowledge, and exchange experiences. So please join me in welcoming Joe to the show. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Fatima. It's great to be here with everyone. It's amazing. Um, it's amazing that I don't even know how to pronounce your surname because I everyone probably, like myself, calls you PMO Joe. So how do we pronounce your surname? Easiest way to remember is think of the word buzz, but uh-huh. with a P. So okay. Joe Puzz. There you go. I was doing your intro and I didn't even mention your surname because I was like, I don't want to get it wrong. But also everyone knows you as PMO Joe. So I want to start with that. Where did you get that title from? Like, was it given to you by someone? Did you think of it yourself? Where, When did it start and like, how did that come about? Yeah, my first clients that we ever had uh, was working with one of our um, directors at the client site. And he said, uh, so Joe, what's your specialty? And I said, well, really PMOs, but I was working on a project at the time. We weren't really doing a PMO build for them. And he goes, so you're PMO Joe? And I said, that's brilliant. I've I've never heard that before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have that stick and use that. So that's 10 plus years ago. Wow. And we've, it's just taken off. I mean, just as a great fit, it's what we do. It's what I specialize in. And uh, it just kind of has become who I am, right? I'm, I'm just PMO Joe now. And and you've found, you've got, uh, surely you've got to give him royalties for all the work. You know, you won PMO Leader of the Year in 2022. So that person surely is getting some royalties or wish they signed a contract that they could get royalties from all the hard work you've been doing. Maybe not, but uh, hey, they were a client, so they got great service from us. Like maybe that's more important. Amazing, that makes sense. And it's interesting. One of the other things I was reading about you, and I know we've we've speak often and have known each other for a long time. I was on your show uh, a little while ago, and then I thought, why why wouldn't you be on our show? We've got so many people that are always wanting to know more about the PMO industry, and especially coming from um, America, having that sort of that sort of. Um, line of sight to what's happening there. So we'll get into that. But you do a lot of the work, a lot of work um, with the not-for-profit called VP MMA. Can you tell us right. like, where did that come from? What is it about and how you got involved? Yeah, VP MMA stands for the Veteran Project Manager Mentoring Alliance. And it's a nonprofit organization that really is our opportunity to give back to veterans, military veterans and spouses who are now transitioning into a civilian career. And project management is just such a great fit for veterans because of the structure that they training they receive in the military. And, uh, but there was really never a way, I couldn't think of how do I do that, right? How do I help veterans? 
So I reached out to a, a friend of mine, worked for a company called Vets to PM, and he provided PMP training to veterans. Mm -hmm. And we said, what can we do together as two different people, two different organizations, two different followings to be able to help veterans? And he's a veteran. And he said, you know, where we're missing as veterans when we come out isn't necessarily the technical project management um, knowledge. It's how do we network? How do we write a resume? How do we interview? What do we wear? How do we show up for work? It's, it's that mentoring piece that's missing. And I said, well, I don't know a lot about being a veteran, but I'd certainly know a, a lot about being in the civilian workforce. What if we com combined forces your company and my company, and we start a brand new nonprofit, we'll call it VPMMA. We, we hashed over that name for a while. And I think it was a Thursday afternoon when we had that call. And by Monday morning, our website was built. We had no idea how many people were going to show up. We didn't do any advertising. We didn't do any promotions. And then that first week, over 20 people came to the website asking for a mentor. So we knew we were on to something. And I think geez, I think we're close to four or five years now that this has been in a place and, you know, 300 plus veterans have gotten assistance from us. It's just been a blast, really. Wow. So does that mean you um, have people like yourself volunteering to be mentors um, to offer their services to help the veterans? Yeah, everyone's a volunteer, right? There's no salaried employees within the organization. Uh, we do have some organizations who provide funding which allows us to have technology and build websites and and use software, et cetera, to be able to help in the process. But it's completely a volunteer-run organization. The board of directors are all volunteers. All of the mentors are volunteers. It's primarily in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we all know, we all have troops stationed around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so we've even had some of our mentees, some of the active duty service members, who were getting mentoring and they couldn't even tell us where they were located, right? It was, um, call me between this time and this time, and I can't mm -hmm. tell you where I'm at, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's been a lot of fun to be able to really give back yeah. and provide for folks. So, you know, they serve us, right? They're, they're working out there, risking their lives every day. What's the the least we could do is, is how can we give them something? What can we do to be able to prepare them yes. when they get out of the military? So. It's been uh, going on for a while. It's it's uh, you feel good about it, and it's something within our industry. Absolutely. Um, so I don't have to learn something new to be able to give back. Right. It, it just fits into everything we're doing. Amazing. It's very rewarding for sure, and I think um it's, oh, you've helped a lot of people. So it's it's yeah just a great news story. I think for uh we're we're in Friday. We're on Friday. I know you're on Thursday, but for Friday. So thank you for yeah. sharing that. Thinking about um PMO, which obviously is now part of your name formally and maybe not certified, but formally. You've been doing it for a long time. And I know that because we've spoken about it for a really long time. I'm kind of keen to see what do you think have been the biggest changes in the PMO space over the last you know, decade? Yeah, this is, yeah, I think about this one a lot because we see out on social platforms, so many experts now in the world who have an opinion about PMO is good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and they all seem to still hold on to the old school view of what a PMO is. It's the auditing and governance function within the organization to make sure the process of delivering a project is being adhered to. That's not PMOs anymore, right? Mm -hmm. sure, sure, there are some PMOs out there that are still behaving that way. And that's usually when they come to a company like yours or a company like mine and ask for some help to be able to modernize themselves. But the reality is PMOs today are about how do I drive strategic outcomes for companies, mm -hmm. right? They have understood, especially with COVID, right? It became so obvious during COVID when organizations basically at the snap of a finger said, we have to go through a digital transformation this weekend. Everybody in our company is going to now be a remote employee and all of the technology and security we've set up has to work for them. Mm -hmm. And project managers around the world kicked off and executed on projects that provided a direct path to the strategic outcomes of the organization. And when we delivered on that, I think organizations said, whoa, we didn't know that we could deliver this. We, 
we kind of created this project and said it had to be done, but we didn't know we were going to actually be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Project managers were at the forefront of that. And I think it changed the way organizations viewed their PMOs and said, if you could do that to get us in and through this COVID period, why can't you get that uh, same mindset to help us enter a new geographic area, to start selling a new product, to be able to manufacture something new, right? All of that goodwill that we built up in COVID, I think, changed PMOs forever. Mm. It, it's no longer about governance and adherence to policy and procedure. It's not now about delivering strategic outcomes, providing value back to the organization, and driving impactful change, right? We drive change in companies. And PMOs are at the center of doing that for every organization out there. That, to me, is the biggest change over the past really only about three years or so. It's really interesting because I wrote something the other day about, um, and it's it's like been, I think, liked 160 times and he has been like a lot of impressions. And it was just simply the fact that PMOs have changed a lot over the last two or three years. And I said primarily in the last 18 months. And it's interesting because I've, I noticed that too. I didn't tie it directly to COVID, but I think it's a really good point you make because when thinking about sort of the last 10 years and then now where we are, I feel like 10 years ago, PMOs didn't really have um, an opportunity to have a seat at the table or really to be taken seriously. I know everyone uses the word admin when they think about PMO and, and really that's all that was seen as because um, they didn't seem to be driving that value or making that change. And there was a lot of that negative connotations and experiences that people have. In the last few years, I feel like for the first time ever in my career of doing this, I think now nearly 20 years, is I feel like PMOs are wanted, valued. There's more jobs advertised than ever before, at least what I'm seeing here in Australia. There's more requests for help in that space. And people actually, there's more people, and we know this from the PMO leader community, which we'll talk about shortly, that want to know more about it and get involved in it. So I would agree completely. And I think the last few years have been a massive turning point compared to when I sort of was talking about it about five years ago in a white paper that it needs to get change something needs to change and it's really good because we've got leaders like yourself and many others that we know that we can name that are really driving that agenda and focusing on as you said driving value and linking to strategic objectives not just about you know rules and procedures and things like that so yeah I would agree yeah. with that. it's fascinating how the shift has been happening yeah it it's we also see that there's a changing generational component to leaders within organizations yes right we go back 10 years ago almost 11 years ago now when the pmo squad started a lot of the leaders who we were trying to sell our services to have retired yeah there's a new group of leaders that are coming into organizations into roles so as we bring in a different flavor of pmo there isn't the old guard leadership yes. who remembers the old pmos right so there's an expectation now the shift within the PMO industry, but within corporations around the world, mm -hmm. that new leadership brings new thought, brings new execution, brings new value to organizations. So it's, I think, a combination of things, certainly not all on COVID, but I think some of the older folks who had built up amazing experience for their business leadership capabilities, yes, but maybe had an old world view of bureaucratic processes and how things needed to be done in an organization, mm -hmm. organizations don't behave the same way anymore, no. right? They have to be more nimble. They have to be more fast. I'm intentionally not trying to say agile because we don't want to confuse anyone here, but yes. they have to be adaptable, Yes, right? They need to be able to move quickly because the world moves so fast. And an old school PMO can't keep up with that pace of change. You no. have to be a new breed of PMO to be able to be successful in the new business environment we're in. Yeah, 100%. And what's interesting to me is when when I read a white paper a few years ago, I was talking about how far project management has advanced since its inception many, many, many decades ago. And then comparing that to where PMO is, and you see that there has been so much leaps and bounds in project management excellence. And to the point where I'd even argue and still argue that uh, many organizations, even some of our really big organizations are well known, like the PMI, et cetera, for a long time ignored PMO because it wasn't important. But now, and we both know this as volunteers with PMI, we are seeing that they are paying more attention because they realize it's important. So for 
one of the you know basically the biggest project management in organization in the world which has you know more certification certified members and members in general and chapters etc for them now to start paying more attention to pmos just proves the point that you and i've just made around pmos becoming far more valuable and i think that's why people are excited to be part of it i think i love the the taking something from chaotic to being organized and actually doing that over and over and over again. Um, and I think that's just part of the fun of it. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting space. And I think, I think we should definitely talk, touch on agile. Um, you know, I've got agile, we've got agile in our name. We have to talk about it. Um, people confuse agile as, is it about agile based methods or are we talking about agile in terms of agility and mindset? I'm keen to kind of get your thoughts on, like the, the last sort of five years has been heavily, or at least in our region, heavily transitioned to new ways of working that are agile based and obviously now also incorporating the agile mindset. So that's actually in the first part of that five year cycle, I think a lot of PMOs were discounted, dismissed, dissolved, downsized. And then we saw a gap between how organizations were trying to keep projects on track and get them organized to deliver value, but realize there was a piece of the puzzle missing and have started to bring them back in, even if they're under different names. What have you been seeing around Agile and the PMO in your space? Yeah, I think for me, it, it had always historically been an or conversation, right? It's traditional or modern. It's waterfall or Agile, right? I think the evolution has been, it's turned and become an and conversation. Right. You don't have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. You can be doing traditional project delivery and then utilize agile mindset to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. You can use agile principles on a traditional project. You can build scrum teams and still deliver in a waterfall manner if you want. Right. There's so much intertwi uh, intertwining between them mm -hmm. that we created this false sense of competition. Right it's kind of like a, you know, I always give the example or not just me, but many people do of construction workers, mm -hmm. right? Do I use my screwdriver or do I use my hammer? Two separate tools, accomplish two separate things, but I need both of them in my tool belt. Mm -hmm. And I use the right one at the right time. Yeah, It's the same with, within our projects and our PMOs. If I have knowledge of how to use both of those tools, we will build better PMOs and deliver better projects. So for me, this whole view is it's the shift. It's the stop thinking it has to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's start figuring out how we use both of them. Yes, There's good in both of them. Yes. And I think if we learn to use the good, then obviously we're all better successful related to that type of work. Yeah, absolutely. And not everything is black and white. we got to focus on the gray. Yeah. You're absolutely right. A lot of the times um, when I see debates online about things, people are, you know, you can't use Agile for this. You can't use Agile for that. And considering almost every company around the world creates some version of hybrid, mix, mixing the bits and pieces, it makes sense because that's what suits their environment. So I always stress to people that to put, ad, you sort of, it's not about putting Agile into governance um, it's sorry, it's about putting the agility into governance as opposed to putting the governance into agile. And the way that they do that is by focusing on the how, not the what. Because PMO, if I talk about what PMO is for one company and you talk about PMO for one company, the, the what, the capabilities, the processes fundamentally are going to be very much the same. It's the how you apply it in that cert certain in environment, that maturity, the people that you're working with, and all of that and how it's adopted, I think is what changes. So yeah, it's about the how and I think focusing on the gray because you can have both. Um, and that's pretty much what, at least what I'm seeing, every company is using both in just one shape or another. Yeah. And I think there's also been a shift probably in the past five to 10 years as well about a movement away from project management and a movement to project delivery, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? before we were managing and controlling projects, right? But you don't produce outcomes through management. You produce the outcomes through delivery, Yes. right? So part of having a delivery mindset is my sponsor doesn't care how I do the work. Mm -hmm. They care about the outcome we're producing. Yes. And before I was concerned with the old school PMO of 
how was very important because I was going to get audited on how I worked. Today, in this new, faster evolving economy that we're in that you have to adapt and move quickly, they're not as concerned. You don't get stopped at the gate review anymore because you didn't complete a checklist. Exactly. Because we're we're focused on delivering the outcome. Mm -hmm. How do you deliver that outcome? However you need to, yes. to guarantee you have success. 100%. So PMI, we've mentioned them in the past, right? We saw that in the latest version of the PMBOK where they sh shifted to a principle-based mindset, right? As opposed to um, a process-driven mindset, which was in the prior versions of the PMBOK. Yes. That to me was an acknowledgement to the industry. We're changing the way we work. Yes. Right? We now have to have almost a consulting mindset within our own organizations to be able to deliver the outcomes that our organization needs. Yeah, hundred percent. And, you know, when you think about that example, you just gave around the sponsor. Well, if I look at a project manager, project manager, again, they understand that there's rules that need to be followed and guidelines. So we can't get away from some external or organizational governance, but at the end of the day, they just want to get on with delivery and anything that's impeding them from delivering the outcome is going to be frustrating for them. So I guess when we think about working with project managers and getting them on board, because I feel like sometimes in some um, environments I've seen there's a conflict between project management and governance being the PMO umbrella. I always say, try to remind those people in that PMO space that without project managers and delivery, there's no need for us. We don't exist. So you've got to get them on board. Have you got any yeah. tips for you know beginner PMOs on how to not alienate project managers, but to bring them on board? Yeah, I think we have different departments throughout organizations that are already there, they're already successful, and already providing value. So we should be building our PMO with those success stories as a reference point. An example would be the sales department. Mm -hmm. The sales department has a process, right? They have a CRM system that they're supposed to be updating. Mm -hmm. They have governance in place within sales organizations. But I've never been around an SVP or an executive over sales who said, stop, you can't sign off on that sale until you update the CRM system, mm -hmm. right? It's about the outcome. It's about close the deal. What do you need for you to be able to close that deal? PMOs are starting to adapt that same mindset. What do you need to finish that project? What? Can, how can we help you close the deal on, on the project? So for me, PMOs who are starting out, how do you bring those project managers on board? Show them how a sales department operates with the sales team. Mm -hmm. We want to operate that same way. We want to be able to be moving fast, right? We're the change that takes place in the organization, right? Right There's a, uh, right now while we're, we're taping this, it happens to be during Laura Bernard's Impact Summit. Mm -hmm. And Antonio Nieto Rodriguez had an, uh, a presentation, a session during there. And he talked about projects are all about the future of a company and operations are all about the current time within a company. Yep. Right. I want to be working on the future. I don't want to be working on what's happening today. I want to be changing the organization for what's coming tomorrow. What better role to be able to do that than as a project delivery person. Yeah. Right. So for me, have a sales mindset treat us as if we're the change agents within the organization. And we've been selected to lead the most important future items in the company. 100%. It's the most exciting role to have in any company. Yeah, 100%. And if you're really good at what you're doing in PMO, you're across multiple of those projects. You're not less facilitating yeah. one of them. So 100%. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's really interesting. We talk about the future. Um, Antonio is coming up as one of the guests on our podcast in a few weeks' time. So um, it'll be good to talk more about that. What What do you think or what are you seeing as some of the trends in PMO in the, you know, let's say in the coming 12 months? I always hate this question because we can go back <laughs> and you can say they were wrong, right? I just, I posted a LinkedIn <laughs> article this week where I did that. We were talking about, uh, you know, AI is all the buzz. Yes. And and I went back over, it's back to 2017, and listed all the people who said the top trends in the next 12 months, AI was part of those trends. Yes. So here we are six plus seven years later. Yeah, it's still popular, right? But it hasn't quite hit mainstream. It's coming, no doubt. Yes. Um, so I don't like to do the what's what's coming and like what's popular in 2024. What do we need to be on the lookout for? Mm -hmm. I think it's the movement, furthering the movement towards strategic delivery 
furthering the movement of project management and agile working together. Um, I, I think those are the two things that are just going to continue. I, I don't think there's one specific trend that's going to kind of break through for next year. I think, I think if you go back to what you said earlier, as long as people are being adaptable to what's happening around them, that's fine. I know your comment um, regarding trends. We we usually write a week, uh, sorry, a yearly blog that talks about trends. And I'm pleased to say that a lot of the time that those things do evolve and happen to be things that are more present. I do hear a lot about, you know, AI and concepts of that. And I know that's one of the topics we're going to talk about in, in the coming weeks. But um, I think then if we think of it from a different perspective, rather than predicting what we think the future might hold, why don't we talk about what is the sort of themes you're seeing with your existing um, sort of clients that, you know, the PMO squad, just you're working with a lot of different companies, different sizes, different maturity. What are sort of the common challenges or pain points that they're struggling with that they usually bring in helpful? Yeah, it, almost across the board, everybody has challenges with resource management. Yes. Um, and I think the problem we've, we within organizations have allowed resource management to be assigned to the PMO. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with the PMO. <laughs> None of the resources in the organization, except for the project managers, maybe some BAs, maybe some coordinators, some schedulers, everybody else is in operations. They're within the rest of the organization. Yes. So we don't, all we can do is request a resource. The person who assigns that is in the operations, one of the other functions. It needs to be an enterprise function resource management. So it's always a challenge for PMOs because we have no authority in the area. Mm -hmm. So we always struggle when it's placed on our hands. So we always work with organizations to bring resource management back to the enterprise level. Um, another thing we often see within PMOs that we find is uh, they're trying to identify their maturity level. Right. Am I a maturity level one, two, three, four, five? There's a, a million different scoring mechanisms out there for where they are. And, but the problem with that is it measures your maturity today. Mm -hmm. It's like taking a picture tomorrow. The picture may not be valid. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with the PMO squad is we've built a journey and identify that you're at a spot in the journey. It's like going on a hike. If I'm hiking up a mountain and I take a picture of where I am, Five steps later, I could take a different picture and it's only been two minutes. Mm -hmm. So does it matter what maturity level I am right now? What I want to know is what's the path I'm going to take to reach the top of the mountain? Yes. And then what's the path I'm going to take to come down? That journey is what's more important to me than a snapshot in time. Mm. So what we've been helping organizations do is recognize that although you want your PMO to be better right now, Yes. It's going to take 18 months. It's going to take 24 months. It's going to, whatever the duration is before you start seeing that value. And the reason for that is because the organization has to accept what the PMO is offering. Yes. Right. If we put in place that we're going to use portfolio management to select our strategic projects and then assign resources to work on them. When we go out and make a request for resources, if we find out that everybody in that department's been assigned to some dark project that wasn't even in the portfolio, yes, the organization has a problem, not the PMO. 100%. So part of our journey is, it's a five-step journey. It's ad hoc project delivery to standardizing project delivery to then organizational acceptance once you have acceptance, you can then move into a strategic position. Mm -hmm. And after strategy, you're creating value, right? So where am I in that journey? Not what's my maturity? Because you can be as mature as you want, but yeah. not have an organization that buys into what you're doing. 100%. And your maturity doesn't matter. So that's what we've been saying. It's it's the resource management challenge. And it's the, the, the belief that I need to know my maturity. Well, yeah. you don't. You just need to know where you are in your journey mm -hmm. and make sure that you understand how to keep moving forward during that journey? I think the, the the times where I've had clients ask to benchmark their maturity is usually because the person, the PMO head, the leader, the director, et cetera, usually wants to use that as a marker for a point in time to show the organization how they've evolved and how they've made improvements and how they fix things along the way. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, how people perceive that. It's it's probably to your point. You need to know what the journey is going to look like, where you're going, 
Um, but I was watching um, a Reese Witherspoon movie yesterday called Wild, and she has got no hiking experience, but was doing this really massive hike. Um, actually, I don't know if it's a real real hiking trail, but it's, I think it's called the PCT um, in the US. And interestingly, as she progressed on the journey, her maturity of hiking and learning the learnings along the way got better. Along the journey, she would bump into strangers that would either feed her or provide her comfort or whatever it might be. So again, she would then pivot and change the direction she was going. So I think knowing where you're starting at the minimum and knowing where you want to go, but then what happens in between will probably evolve based on people coming to the organization, like I said, the acceptance, how the change is adopted, um, who's running with it, is there any COVID scenarios that, you know, derail things. So um, I think I like the the concept of taking people on the journey. And also that's a really good way of using um, change management concepts of taking people on that journey to get them to adopt the changes that you're recommending. So yeah, interesting, um, interesting place to, um, interesting place to segue now. I think you mentioned technology, like briefly mentioned like portfolio management. I want to talk just briefly for technology for a second. So when we think about, um, the most common technology in PMO, it's the PPM or project portfolio management tool, which I know you know lots and lots about, and I've dealt with a lot of companies that have that space. Lots of times I see people asking to bring in something and they are bringing it in and probably have no actual view of what their processes are, or they probably don't even know how to schedule, but then they want to bring in a PPM and start using the schedule capabilities. How do you know if for PMOs that are starting out or maybe on their midway through their journey, how do you determine it's the right time to bring in a PPM tool, would you say? Yeah, it, certainly it's not at the beginning right? when, as you mentioned, a lot of them think, hey, if I build, if I implement a technology, then the organization will use it. Mm-hmm. Well, they're not going to because they, they don't understand how to use it or why to use it. Yes. So for us, again, we've got the five stage journey. Ad hoc is first. Don't use a tool during ad hoc. Mm -hmm. Excel, PowerPoint, you can get away with a lot of the office suite tools to be able to help you. 100%. The next step on that journey is standardized project delivery. Now you can start thinking tool because there's a consistent way to do that, right? We're going to be using the same templates. We're going to be using the same requests. We're going to be using the same kickoff meetings and the cadence of an organization. Maybe then. But again, it depends on each organization is unique. By the time you get to where the organization accepts project delivery, you have to have a tool at that point. Again, it doesn't mean you need to have the biggest tool out there. It's not a size does not matter in this instance. It's the right tool for your organization. And there's a tremendous amount of tools out there today that are, we'll call them low level tier one type tools, right? They're the smaller tools, but they're effective. They're team management. They're, um, and then we did a survey last year, right, in the PMO squad. And we asked one of our questions, what project management tools do you use? Mm-hmm. And the number one response back was Excel. Yep, not surprising. <laughs> right? And, and so somebody asked the other day, um, why? And I said, that's a good point. Next year, we'll ask that in our follow-up question, right? We should have asked why Excel. Yep. So I can only make some assumptions based off of this. Very few project managers come out of university and become a project manager right away. Mm-hmm. A lot of us, almost all of us, have had some role for a while, Yes. found project management, and then moved into it. Mm -hmm. So that may have been two years, five years, 10 years in a organizational role, not as a project manager. What tools were you using during that time? Excel, PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So you've become comfortable with the tool set that you bring with you into the project management role. And now I have to go learn plan view, Meister plan, keyed in, whatever, whatever tool it may be, man, that's hard. Yes. I'm just going to stick with the tool that I've been using for the past decade. Mm-hmm. So for us, when we we never lead the conversation with a new client about technology, because we don't even know what their process needs to be yet. We don't know how the organization is going to respond to them. We don't know what the purpose of the PMO is at the beginning point. So for us, technology starts when you standardize, move into acceptance and utilize what works. Yeah. Don't let technology be the barrier to success, right? 
And and that's often what we find is so many PMO leaders saying, I just went out and spent $200,000 on this fantastic tool and nobody's using it. Can you help us get them to use it? <laughs> well, we can, but it's going to take a while because first we have to improve your process up front. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting like a lot of the um lots and lots of companies that we've worked with are spending like I said hundreds of thousands of dollars and then not only that they've got licensing agreements for support but they never use it because when the the software is implemented it's not implemented from the perspective of the client it's implemented from the perspective of the provider of the software because they don't generally have people in house that are either at the right capability level or experience to actually facilitate that transition of bringing in that product. I agree with you completely on the processes need to be defined and understood. Companies out there are bringing in PPM tools that do resource enterprise resource planning and scheduling and risk and issues, but they don't even know how to do that in delivery land already fundamentally, whether it's in Excel or off the back of a whiteboard, they don't know how to do that to begin with. So then you're going to add the complexity of a tool, which usually is brought in because someone used it at another company and they think it's the best tool, but they don't actually assess whether it's the right tool for the size of the organization, the department, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think, yeah, picking the right tool would be only after we've understood what the processes are that we're trying to automate. And mm -hmm. also don't like, don't, eat the frog like don't do everything at once maybe focus on the pipeline is usually the most popular part of the tool get that right and then demonstrate its value and then start adding other capabilities as you go and I think that's one of the things that we've been stressing to customers it's like you don't have to have everything except the kitchen sink up front you actually can just do bite-sized modular capabilities and that will help you to iteratively improve and bring people on that journey yeah and I think that's another shift within PMOs is the old school PPM tried to be a one size fits all, right? We're going to put everything that you can think of with project management into this PPM solution. An organization starting back away from that. They may be using Trello to do some um, Kanban boards. They may be using Asana for team collaboration and communication. Mm -hmm. They may be using monday.com, right? They're going to be using a bunch of different tools today and it's not the one size fits all. So I think that to your point, I think it's now about how should we use the tool? And I don't have to have just one. 100%. I could be able to use a tool that works for our organization to do what we need it to do. Yeah. And I would highly recommend that people undertake a tools amnesty of listing out all the tools that exist within their department or their organization. Because a lot of the times these PPM companies, um, some uh, just tech companies in general, you'll find that they're in one part of the business set up one way and then they're in another part of the business set up another way. And so by the time you know it, you're probably paying three times as much because um, it's spread everywhere. You end up having what I call the tools monopoly with tools that do not talk to each other, do not connect it. And then you've got, you know, as you said, you might end up having those tools, but they're not they're not thought of as a cohesive, organized approach to using tools for knowledge management. They're just sporadic and everybody's using something different. And then that's impossible to consolidate and actually have a clear path and how you're moving forward. So I think a little bit of an amnesty is always helpful, like we do with the meetings so when we're trying to cut down on meetings. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. I, I want to move into um, one last topic on PMO and one that I'm very close to um, around the PMO leader. Um when setting up the PMO leader community, and I remember a few years ago, it was about three years ago, where you raised the idea with me to join you on that journey. What do you think at the time was missing for PMOs that you thought the TPL, the PMO leader, could solve for? And, and what have you seen? Um, have you seen that actually eventuate from your perspective in the last few years? Yeah. So for me, I was trying to fill the gap of stickiness right? We were in the middle of COVID. There were conferences all over the world. You could attend any conference. You'd be able to participate in any conference. But when the conference was over, where were all the friends that you just made? You, you lost track of all of them. So to me, what was missing, because we have some great communities, certainly within the PMO space around the world, but they had, they kind of have a, a, a product I don't, want, I don't want to call any of them out or whatever, but there's something about them that attracts people to it, but it was never community, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't the aspect that you could come here and you have a home and you can stay and it becomes sticky. 
So when we created the PMO leader, that was the mindset of where can I go not to get a certification, not to be able to get um, maybe an awards or a competition, or it, it was more about the people in the community as opposed to what the community produced. I mean, after all, isn't that kind of what community is supposed to be? Mm-hmm. So for me, I didn't want to have people talking in our community that talk everywhere. Mm-hmm. I wanted to hear from the people who didn't have a platform, but they're really good at what they do. And maybe they're in a country that doesn't allow them to be able to get out and speak on a world stage. And that, I think we've been very successful. We've had webinar series, we've got book clubs, we've got people hosting and leading communication channels that were never involved in any of this in the past. And they were just community members who said, hey, I'd like to start a book club. You think that's okay if I talk to authors from around the world? Absolutely, that's what our community asked for. So I think we've been successful. I think we've grown incredibly fast. 100%. I think we put on the most uh, exciting and um, energized conference in the world, yes. uh, virtual conference. I know in-person conferences are are certainly better and I would prefer to do that, but we're a global community. So I think it's hard to do that. Um, and we've been open to ideas mm-hmm. that community members have asked for. 100%. It wasn't about what I wanted to build or what you wanted to build or what our board wanted to build. It's been a question constantly asked to our members. Yes. What would you like in the community? And we will go make it happen. Yes. And that's how I know we've been successful because they keep asking and we keep delivering. So for me, it's just, it's a really unique community that's built for the members. It's really staffed by the members. We have, I think over 75 volunteers. Yes. Working around the world right now to support all of our, our functions and capabilities. Absolutely. It, it kind of blows my mind, actually, what we've been able to accomplish in just a few years. 100%. Completely decentralized, might we add, in terms of not one, no one person is telling them what to do. Um, the PMO leader community being completely free to join and all of the access to most of that is free as well. Um, great sponsors on board who are joining us for the conference, which we'll talk about in, in just a moment. Um, And I think what I also like is um, I agree. I think people have come to us with suggestions and ideas for things. And to your point, if that's what the community wants, it's what the community gets. It's built by the community. Having 75 volunteers actively and many of them long-term is just phenomenal. And it just shows you that the value that they're getting for some people I've been speaking to who are in the community, they um, have had an avenue to share um, their experiences or they've wanted to learn how to speak and so they've hosted the podcast or they've basically not have got time to be doing this full time they they work in they might not work in project management day to day but they have an interest in it so they're learning and then one of the most um, more recent developments is you know the partnerships with some of the universities to have interns who are now getting their first taste of project management where they're not going to you know break a business or, or make a fall over because they make a mistake but they're actually getting a chance to learn and work with people like you and I which is really not something that's commonly in reach. So, yeah, I, I think it's been great and it's been a great journey to be on. So let's talk about the conference. So I know a lot about it, but most of our listeners don't. So tell me, when's the conference? Yeah. What's it about? And what can people expect? The so conference is October 18th. Um, so some people may say, well, how does that work if you're a global community and October 18th isn't the same based on your geography? Well, we agree. So we're, we do something crazy and probably stupid. We we do a follow the sun format. We start the conference in Australia and it's like New Year's Eve. As the earth rotates, we bring on people from those new locations. So we're live, live online for over 18 hours. It's <laughs> insanity that we're able to pull this off. Um, but we bring people in from the Asia Pacific area and, and Australia and New Zealand and then we move to the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and finish in, in the Americas. Um, so it's got something for everybody, whether it's modern uh, current trends like AI, whether it's PMOs, project management, best practices, all of that. We have a track dedicated to French speaking presenters. So multiple, I think it's six sessions will be in French because uh, we're multilingual. Uh, we have a new concept this year called Open Mic where we're allowing people who are not kind of seasoned professionals to have five minutes to tell their story. 
just like you often see it in a coffee shop or a cafe around the world where people can walk up and sing a song, tell a poem, whatever it may be. Well, you've got five minutes in our, and I've never seen that at any conference anywhere in, that I've ever attended. Um, we have a, an, a really special announcement that's going to be coming out during the conference. Um, it's going to be happening during our, our European time zone. Um, one of our presenters from Germany will be talking about a brand new service that's going to be offered by our community. And I think this is also a first ever in the industry that we're going to be providing to everybody. So it's our second consecutive year of doing this follow the sun format. Uh, no matter where you're located, we're, we'll be there at your time on the 18th to present amazing content for you. And I'm sure I've missed a whole bunch because it's, there's so we much could, going on. We could talk about this for, for the, the whole two hours. Um, but yes, we are starting in Asia Pacific, which is, um, where the team, myself and the team will facilitate. And um, I know for APAC, where we start, we've got people from New Zealand and Singapore and Australia more locally. We've got panels, we've got all sorts of speakers. And the best thing is, as I say to everyone, if you're interested in the MIA or the US region or APAC and you're not in that region, you're not available on the day, register and you can get a recording and watch it in your own time. And I think that's something what a lot, what, which is a lot, a lot the people will be doing as well. But for you and I, I know you were pretty much awake and live almost the whole 18 hours last year. <laughs> and I was probably... Yes, I'm not doing that this year. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, this year, the conference planning has all been led by Alinka Nicolescu uh, out of Canada, who's been doing this. She's been doing an amazing job. Absolutely. She'll probably be up for the whole 18 <laughs> hours this year. Um, and, and you had mentioned sponsors earlier, right? Everything we provide to our community is free. We don't charge them for anything. Absolutely. The only way that happens is by having amazing partners, right? So for the conference, Keyed In is our title sponsor. Um, so certainly thank you to Keyed In for doing that. Planisware, also one of our gold sponsors. And Asana, one of our silver sponsors. So between Keyed In and Planisware and Asana, we're able to bring this to the world for free. Absolutely. And the amount of content and the type of uh, materials being presented, the different variety of presenters, their locations. Again, I know other people put on bigger conferences. I don't know of any other conference I've ever attended that has as much value creation as what you get out of ours. Um, it's only the second year doing it with this format, so maybe it's not as well known as some of the others. But I think if you attend this, you're going to be blown away by everything that's available and it's live it's a hundred percent live right and no recorded wrong. sessions absolutely i remember we had back-to-back -back sessions trying to find time to have lunch and go to the bathroom that was difficult <laughs> but <laughs> but we've got a bit more help this year so yeah it's going to be really good i, I know for me up the day after I, i'm exhausted so it's like having a day off the next day because there's so much um push to drive that value and and it's fun and it's a good experience so um i'll put details in our show notes for that and um that my people can register their interest. How can people get involved with the PMO squad and with you in general? Is there anything um, do you want to share around more information where people can find you? The easiest way, right? Everybody has LinkedIn, social media these days. So if you go out to LinkedIn, search bar, pop in PMO Joe, I'm the only one you're going to see. Um, certainly connect with me. I don't turn anybody away. I get a lot of requests probably weekly from people. Hey, can I get a mentoring session? Can I get five minutes with you? I do my best to connect with everybody that I can. Sometimes I have to say no, and I, I feel bad when that's the case. Uh, it's certainly just uh, all about what's going on at the time. Um, and then the PMO squad, right? That's my company that I started 11 years ago or so, 10 plus years ago. Um, you can just go out to obviously find it in social media as well, but the PMO squad.com. And we're a full service project management consulting firm, probably one of a handful in the entire world that offers staffing and resource solutions, plus PMO builds and improvements, plus technology implementations, people process technology for any project management solution. We do all three avenues and we only do project management. We're not a management consulting firm. It's just project delivery, whether it's agile, whether it's traditional, it doesn't matter. 
Um, and we'd love to hear from you. If you've got a challenge and you need some help, we're here to help you. Amazing. I'll put that in the show notes as well, link to the website. Uh, before we wrap up, Joe, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners, a call to action, a piece of advice, or a question to ponder? I think my kind of mantra is question the status quo. It's kind of helped me build the PMO squad from when we started to where we are now is whenever anybody says, well, that's just the way we've always done it, you know there's an opportunity to make it better. Because the world evolves. If that's the way you used to do it, it probably isn't the best way to do it now. So for me, challenge the status quo, be comfortable being uncomfortable, um, find your own path, be on your own journey, and recognize that it's okay to not have all the answers because you're going to go help go find them and be able to get somebody that can help you get there. Right. So that's the way we've always done it. Opportunity for change, opportunity for improvement at that point. Absolutely. Good, good words to close out. Thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I'm sure everyone's going to get a ton of value and um, yeah, have a good rest of the day. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Please share this with someone or rate it if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow us on social media and to stay up to date with all things Agile Ideas. Go to our website, www.agilemanagementoffice.com. I hope you've been able to learn, feel, or be inspired today. Until next time, what's your Agile Idea?